Um, as I mentioned, this is part three of part eight for the Backyard Fruit webinar series, which is a national collaboration between UGA Extension, Auburn University faculty, LSU Extension, uh, University of Tennessee Extension, and NC State Extension. So we are all really excited to work together and bring to you some information that hopefully backyard gardeners will find relevant in regards to small fruit and tree fruit production. I uh, have the special treat today to introduce Dr. Jay Spears, who was actually my former graduate student advisor at Auburn University. So how fun is it to get to work together professionally today um, for this presentation? So just a little bit about Dr. Spears. Uh, I mentioned he's, he's faculty at Auburn University and he does teach undergraduate and graduate student level courses, but he also has a pretty active research program where he's really focused on doing research for fruit crops that can be successful not only in Alabama, but across the Southeastern United States. So I feel like his knowledge is very suitable for the type of um, information folks are seeking here. So. He's going to focus on backyard production for muscadine and bunch grapes. Um, just like our previous sessions, if you have a question, I encourage you to put it in the Q&A section here at the bottom of your screen. Um, be patient. He will be going through the basics of production. So if uh, you have a basic question, um, see if he covers it first. And if not, or if you have a question about the content he's already mentioned, go ahead and submit that in that Q&A box and uh, myself and our other panelists who are horticulturalists would be happy to answer those questions for you. So um, it looks like our numbers are slowing down a little bit. So instead of stealing the spotlight, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Spears and let him get started on his presentation. All right, thank you, Ashley. This is quite an honor to be able to speak on this topic. I'm, so I teach all the undergraduate uh, fruit production related classes at Auburn. And my research is mostly geared towards, well, towards all, lots of different fruit, but I've mainly focused on blueberries and kiwi fruit and, and citrus and, um, and dabbled a little bit in blackberries and muscadines. But I love muscadines and I'm excited to, to be able to talk about them. So to get us started, I'm going to just go over the different types of grapes. There's, there's lots of different types of grapes, but um, the main ones that are commercial, that you might be familiar with, are the European grape. So Vitus vinifera, that's 90% of world production. Um, most of the, the wines you've heard of are the, are the uh, table grapes that you buy at the grocery store. Those are gonna be Vitus vinifera grapes or European grapes. Um, and so they're, they're by far the dominant grape, but you don't see a lot of them in the South um, because they get this disease. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, but, um, but that's, a, that's a main grape, but we don't, we don't grow those much in the South. Then there's Vitus labrusca, which is also called the fox grape. That's a big one for juice, jellies. So um, if you're buying grape jelly or buying the purple grape juice, it's probably Concord grapes, which is a Vitus labrusca. And so these um, also are mostly susceptible to, to um, Pierce's disease, which restricts their production in the Southeast. Um, these, these have a slip skin. You're, if you're familiar with muscadine, you know what a slip skin is, but this is a much thinner slip skin. Whereas these, the table grapes, European grapes typically have a, a skin that adheres to the flesh. Then there's hybrid grapes which are mostly European uh, grapes crossed with American species. These are mostly to increase disease resistance, cold hardiness. Um, they had a big role in, in, um, in increasing resistance to phylloxera uh, way back when. But um, these, there are some bunch grapes. When I talk about bunch grapes that we can grow that are resistant to Pierce's disease, they would come from this category. They'd be hybrids that might have some European grape in their background and the brusca, um, but we can grow them because they're resistant to Pierce's <coughs> disease. And then there's muscadine. <coughs> Excuse me. Vitus rotundifolia, sometimes known as muscadinia rotundifolia. 
And this is the southern grape. This is the one that's native to the southern U.S. We have a big niche on it. Um, it's mostly local production, but there's, it's starting to get more commercial. Um, the difference between these is that they don't form bunches. And so when I talk about bunch grapes, they're all the ones that form bunches like this, where you just cut the pedestal and then you have a bunch of, you know, a, a solitary bunch. Well, these separate from the bunch. And so we're usually picking them one by one um, and they, and they um, don't ripen evenly like the ones that, that do in bunches. But that's a breeding thing that's being worked on. But muscadines fit great for backyard production. And really, I, I talk about all these other crops in my classes and, and, um, and, and seminars. And, and we have, there's always issues with tree fruit, small fruits. And a big issue is, is spring frost. Um, with muscadines, we, we usually don't have to worry about spring frost. We're always worried about that with blueberries, peaches, strawberries, a lot of our other crops with apples and, and, and pears that we don't necessarily have to worry about spring frost. We have to worry about cold um, um, accumulation and chilling hours and a lot of disease issues. Muscadines are native to our area. And as you probably notice, they grow like a, if they weren't native, they'd be an invasive <laughs> because they grow like kudzu and, and you see them all on the sides of the road. So we know that it's a tough plant that is adapted to our environment and it's about the most likely candidate for, to grow as an organic production or low input and, and, and plant in your backyard and, and um, not have to worry too much about water and irrigation and, and particularly disease and insect problems. But anyways, we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so muscadines, you've probably, if you're from the South, you've probably heard of, um, of muscadines and scepanines. And so just to get that out of the way, these dark muscadines in the south are often called, called bullis or bull grapes or just muscadines usually. I'm from, I'm from south Mississippi and so usually known as musc muscadines for us. Um, but a lot of people call these bronze ones scuppernons and that's fine. Um, but really the, the, um, the, there was one cultivar named scuppernon. That's kind of hard to find, though it's still it's still around. But it was it was located in the wild in the um, in the 1700s, like the first named cultivar. And so it's called it was called Scuppernon after this river in North Carolina, and that name really stuck. And so often, still in the South, we'll call these Scuppernons. Um, so it's a Southern grape. It the muscadine um, you can see in these pictures growing wild over trees. You know, when we when I float the creeks in South Mississippi, the whole under the whole sides of the creek banks are covered in muscadines. Um, and so they're they've developed in our humid climate and with our disease issues, pathogens, um, our warm climates. And so they can handle it and they're perfectly conditioned and actually it's a great niche crop for us in the South because they can't grow these in, in colder climates and a lot of other areas. Um, and so Vitus vinifera, it's, it's native to a, a Mediterranean type climate, low humidity, um, much more temperate climate. And so it lacks resistance to a lot of our disease problems. Makes it a little tougher to grow. So, um, so a major reason we grow mostly muscadines in the south or in the southeast is because of Pierce's disease. But if we can overcome Pierce's disease, Vitus vinifera is still going, or European grapes are still going to have other disease issues that muscadines won't have. Powdery mildew is gonna be worse, downy mildew, some of these other things. So Pierce's disease started in the southeast and um, got um, taken over to California in the late 1800s and, and caused a lot of problems. Some 30,000 acres were destroyed. And so when, you, when the vines get Pierce's disease, there's no known cure. What it does is it blocks the xylem. The xylem is how plants get water from their roots and go through, throughout the rest of the plant, water and nutrients. And so if that's blocked, then it's going to look like drought symptoms. They can't get the water through the rest of the plant. And so some symptoms are kind of yellowing and orange type colors, concentric circles and sometimes in the middle. Um, 
this matchstick is a is a real characteristic where the petioles stay and the leaves fall off. Um, once they get Pierce's disease, you can't cure it, and so it's typically just removing the plants and and finding resistant plants really. And th this Pierce's disease is vectored by a lot of different insects. Glassy wing sharpshooter is usually the one that's that's pointed to as the main vector, but all the leaf hoppers and all the spittle bugs. That, uh, that feed on grapes can transmit this disease. And so you can try to control the insects, but they're very prevalent in the Southeast and it's not, it's not gonna work forever. And so you can try planting Merlot and different, different um, European grapes that are susceptible to Pierce's disease. And maybe you'll get a, a crop um, the first year or two, but eventually they're going to, to some, succumb to Pierce's disease. And so it's not a good long-term strategy to grow those right now. Um, but muscadine is naturally resistant and um, rarely shows symptoms. Sometimes muscadines can have Pierce's disease, but they don't show the symptoms um, very much. And so it's not a big deal. And so that's a big reason that we grow muscadines. You might, you probably know that muscadines are, are really promoted for their health and that's great for the muscadine industry. Um, this, um, I won't get into the fine details of, of all the health benefits, but it's, it's, it's really high in resveratrol. And that's, and that's a, um, an, an, um, um, a phenolic compound or antioxidant that is thought to have a lot of health benefits to reduce inflammation and prevent pathogen um, replication and response. And so um, muscadines aside, business for a lot of uh, wineries could be just selling them as the um they sell this in pill form and those type of things but we know that muscadines are very good for you most of this resveratrol and elagic acid is is unfortunately in the seeds and um and you know muscadines they're not always an inside eating fruit so we often will spit out the seeds and um maybe even spit out the the skins the second most prominent place where these antioxidants are, are located are in the skins. And so it's good to go ahead and chew up and eat those skins. Um, the seeds for me, usually they're pretty hard to chew up and, and eat, but, um, but I have a colleague that, that, um, that works. Uh, we publish a study on elagic acid and resveratrol with muscadines and, and, um, and she would, would grind up the seeds and start adding them to her coffee grounds to try to get that, the, um, the good antioxidants in there. And so, um, anyways, they're really good for you. And, um, and a lot of the other grapes don't have much resveratrol. And, so, and that's a key one that we know is, is very, very good for us. Okay, so muscadines, where they're grown, is typically where it doesn't get too cold, it's where temperatures seldom drop below 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, muscadines can be are, are cold sensitive, and so um, in this in this region, we rarely would have to worry about midwinter temperatures, but um, but can happen if we have you know really fluctuating temperatures or a real cold snap in the in the fall. But in some of these mountainous areas, um, we um, we might have to worry about midwinter cold damage, but um, but anyways, this is typically the range it goes on into East Texas. There's a good bit of production in East Texas as well. So they're well adapted to our region in the southeast. We don't have a lot to worry about compared to just about any other fruit crop I can think think of. <laughs> um, muscadines are the are the most carefree in terms of worrying about climate and disease and insect issues. Um, they do need to need a long um, frost free period, 200 to 240 days. We get that in the, in the Southeast, but that restricts them from growing in, nor in more Northern states. Um, they can handle negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit if they're, if they're hardened, which means if they're in the peak of dormancy in the winter. But what they can handle, like all of our fruit crops, depends on what the preceding temperatures were. And so if we, when we get these, these crazy winters where it, it's 80 degrees and then all of a sudden drops below freezing and then gets, gets back warm again, and those can, uh, can affect muscadines like, um, at times. 
Um, but a good thing about muscadines is once they get dormant, they have a fairly high heat requirement, so they don't get out of that dormancy real quick. And so we don't have to worry about frost damage usually for, for, um, for muscadines. They bloom or start their growth typically pretty late, you know, close to April in, in central Alabama, so we don't have to worry about it too much. When you're choosing a, where to plant your, your muscadines um, in, your, in your backyard or wherever, the most important aspect, similar to, to most fruit crops, is soil drainage. None of these fruit crops like wet, wet roots or to stay in standing water. And so you don't want to plant them in a low lying area. When you plant them, you want to make sure they don't sink down and form a, a hole there where water gathers. They don't want it to be flood, um, prone to uh, flooding. Um, that would go with any fruit crop. Muscadines are no different in that aspect. Um, the soil type is, they can grow in a wide range of soil types. Compared to, to many other fruit crops, they, they're much more adaptable to poor soil conditions than, than most other fruit crops. Um, so I'd, I'd look for a slightly elevated land. You could either even raise the beds if you need to, if you're in, in a clay type soil. Um, you'd like it to be free of, of hard pans that would keep water up, up in the uh, upper profile. Um, the soil pH, you'd want it around 6.5, but the natural soil pH, you would like it to be in the 5.5 to 6.5 range um, where it wouldn't get too, too acidic. But, um, but that can be, be limed up to uh, 6.5. Um, other site considerations, you want full sun for muscadines to make them more productive. Um, you'd like to, them to not be in a, a low-lying area where they don't get good air drainage. And so when you get these cold snaps, you know, the cold air will settle down in the low-lying areas and that will make them more prone to, to freeze damage. And so if you have good air drainage where wind flows through there and the, and the cold air doesn't stay in those low-lying areas, that's going to be much better. So you're going to want to plant on higher ground or slopes if you have, have the, uh, the option. For um, site preparation, this, the, the beginning one year prior to planting is more, uh, I should say, for, for a commercial. But it's never a bad idea to start, <laughs> to start early. Um, a soil test is recommended um, to see where your soil pH is. Also, you know, check for, for nutrients and really soil or organic matter, and that can make a difference on how much you fertilize. If you have a low pH, be best to get it up to 6.5. Um, they can tolerate 5.5 to 7, and so you have a, have a pretty good range of tolerance. You want to get rid of weeds prior to, prior to um, the planting and prior to liming and adding any nutrients. Um, this will just save you in the long run if you can if you can plow that area and, or till it. This says deep plow to 15 to 20 centimeters. That's not going to be feasible for most homeowners, and it's not absolutely necessary. And for it's it's better, but um, but if I was going to plant in my backyard today, I would not do <laughs> do that. I don't have the yard for it, and so I'd probably till it and tr and try to get rid of the the uh, the, the weeds best I could. And then I would I would um, prepare the soil to to uh, to plant. All right. So for planting, um, you want you want to plant. You can sometimes get away with planting in the fall. And a lot of our our fruit trees and, and trees in general, we'd want to plant in the fall. But if they're somewhat cold sensitive, which satsumas are. I mean, I'm sorry, which uh, muscadines are. Um, then you would want to uh, postpone until after any chance of hard freeze. And so we typically would plant in April in our in, in central Alabama. Um, so mid-April is usually a good time to plant. Your plants are going to be dormant typically when you put them in, or they might have started some growth by this time if you kept them out. Um, you want to make sure to keep your roots wet during the planting process. Most people will have a bucket of water out there and they'll just keep the plants, the roots in, in that. Um, a large planting hole is beneficial to let those roots really spread out. Um, and the roots might look like this, and so they, or they could be be pot bound. And so if they're they're in a pot and they're um and they're wrapping around that pot, 
you're going to want to to spread them out and if it and if it calls for using a knife to score around the side of that that pot to, so you can spread them out then go ahead and do it and give them them room to grow in that planting hole so spread them out um, never put fertilizer directly in the planting hole i don't think that's that's advisable for any any plants um, they can be sensitive and especially when you're they're just getting started and so you don't want to risk burning the roots with with fertilizer um, and then you want to want to fill in that hole then add add a bunch of water um, and at times i'll pull up on the plant to make sure it's it's got good suction and water is getting all, all down to the roots and then after that i'd add add more dirt and then pack it pack it firmly um, you don't want to plant these too deep like with anything else you want to keep them at the same level they were planted in in the nursery um, grow tubes are, are not absolutely necessary but um but they do help particularly if you have problems with deer and if you're using herbicide treatments to um to keep the weeds at bay um, but you want to take these off in august to allow the vines to, to harden they can keep them warm and keep them from going into into dormancy if you leave them on there all right so when you're um when you're planting these for your 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 backyard production how close you plant you plant them berries um, typically the more plants per acre the, the year, lower yield on a per plant basis but uh, up to a point the greater the yield per acre um, and and the effect of spacing obviously gets gets more profound um, as, as the plants grow typically the classic spacing is 20 feet apart within the rows and then maybe 12 feet apart between rows and this is for typical for commercial production and so we'll talk about these different trellis systems but the spacing between rows will be a little bit different for this but people will um will space these you know 16 feet apart 18 feet apart um you can um for me i would i would want to probably try different cultivars in in, in my backyard production and so i would i would lean towards a tighter plant spacing um I'm also probably wouldn't follow direct commercial guidelines. And so I might not, not be able to take care of them <laughs> quite as well. And so I think you can get by with a, with a closer spacing, maybe, maybe 16 feet or so. So I guess the most difficult thing for, for backyard production of muscadines and bunch grapes is that they are a vine and they require a trellis system. And so that's different than, than you know, standalone fruit trees there's two basic types, and I'm mostly talking about muscadines instead of bunch grapes because muscadines are what most of you should be planting. Uh, then I'll, at the end, I'll talk about bunch grapes that are supposed to be tolerant for, for Pierce's disease and, and um, might be also some, some options. But for backyard production, definitely easier in most cases to grow muscadines. Um, so there's, for muscadines, there's, two, there's a single wire trellis like this one right here. This one is by far the most common commercially and, um, and, and fairly common for backyard production too. Its advantages is that it, it's, it's simple. It doesn't cost the trellis. Um, trellis cost might be comparable, but probably a little bit cheaper. Um, training is pretty simple. You just train them up to there and get cordon going in each way, get good air movement, easier for, for harvesting and pruning and all these all these different things and then there's a geneva double curtain and it's it's a little bit more expensive more intensive management its advantage is that it makes better use of the land and so instead of this 20 say these are planted 20 feet apart you have 20 20 linear feet of of uh, canopy in production well with this you have 40 linear feet and so they're going to be more productive and you can get maybe a third more um, productivity in, in the same amount of space. Oops. All right, so the single wire trellis is, um, is again preferred because of ease of establishment, pruning, harvesting, and renovation. Um, major disadvantage is, is lower yields, but, um, but muscadines are still pretty, pretty productive. And for backyard use, 
Um, it'd be a tough decision for me on whether to go with um, Geneva Double Curtain or Single Wire Trellis, but I would probably want to test a bunch of, of cultivars instead of, you know, making getting the most out of one one plant. And so I'd probably go with the Single Wire Trellis. Um, it definitely makes um, pruning easier. So you can look at this and see that sometimes muscadines require um, some in-season pruning, summer pruning, some hedging, and it's a lot harder to get in here and prune um, in the, on the inside of this canopy with this one than it is with this one. Um, for the, I'm not going to get into too much on the, the construction of these. There's a lot of different ways to construct these, these trellis systems. Um, a good resource in which I got a lot of this information from is this Muscadine Grape Production Guide for the Southeast. Um, just Google that and you can get a lot, a lot more detail on the, um, on the ins and outs of the size of the post. You can use wooden or metal post. Um, if it's wooden, you, wood posts and you want it to be, you know, at least five or six inches in, in diameter for the end post, at least three inches in diameter for the interior. And then um, a big consideration also is the, uh, the gauge of the wire that you're using within the, within the vineyard. Muscadines are really vigorous and they can, can put, end up putting a lot, of, a lot of weight on those, on those wires. And so um, that's a big consideration with your, with your trellis system. Okay, the Geneva Double Curtain, that was um, developed in New York to train vigorous grapevines. And muscadines again are really vigorous for us, and so we can um, we can get a lot more fruit, maybe a third more fruit because of the um, the um, more canopy with the Geneva double curtain. Um, but um, it's a little bit more more complicated to, uh, to for some of the aspects with air drainage and with with pruning. But it's a really good technique, and and a lot of people do use it for for pick your owns. It makes the most use of your um, of your available space, and so it's it's a um, it's a good training system. All right, so I know this is a lot. I'm gonna I needed this to help me keep keep me on track for the training aspect, but then I'll I'll, I'll explain this further in the next next slides. All right, so when you plant a muscadine, you're going to again start with a with a small plant, and then you're going to typically be putting it at while it's still dormant or just coming out of dormancy. And that first, first two years, you're, just, you're not gonna get any fruit until year three. And so the first two years are just to develop the permanent trunk and fruiting arms. And so in the spring, after, right after planting, um, if, if required and, and often a good idea, you're going to, to stub prune that, that, um, that plant. Not absolutely required, but you're going to select, um, it's going to send out some new shoots and it's going to be more than one. It's going to be two to four shoots and you're going to select when they get to about one foot in height, you're going to select the strongest and, and then remove all the others. Then you're going to often they say to, to use a string to train it up to the, to the wire. Um, a bamboo stake works probably, it's probably easier and works better a lot of times, but um, to keep because you want that vine to be to go up straight and you and you can use some clips to um to tie it to that bamboo stake and i i think commercially that might be more common because it, it seems a little easier but anyways you can use a string or a wire and get that that single trunk to to climb up that that wire um and so if you're using string drive the straight the stake in the ground about three inches from the plant and then tie the the end of that string to the trellis wire if you're using a Geneva double curtain trellis, you're going to want it right in between those those wires. And so you're going to tie a string in between the two wires and then have one coming down right in the middle to get it to come up to that. Um, then you want to prune the trunk back to approximately four to five inches below the wire the first winter. This isn't absolutely necessary. What you're trying to do is get one, one single trunk to go up there and then the cordons to go this way. Um, if you have a really vigorous vine and you get that and it keeps growing and you get that in one season, that's, that's possible. But often it, 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 it's not going to make a huge difference if, you, if it's not, not branching much to go ahead and cut it back 
four to five inches below that wire and then select the, the, the next two lateral shoots so that'll be your cordon um, branches. For Geneva double curtain, the difference is you have those two, two wires and so you're going to, to end up cutting it, getting it to branch, and then cutting it again to get it to branch this way. All right, so this was taken from that Muscadine Great Production Guide for the Southeast. And so you can, within your trellis, you have the option of putting it pretty close to the, to the post, um, but most people will put it right in the center in between the posts. So these are 20 feet apart or right in the middle, 10 foot centers, you would put your plant typically. And then you'll have a, a bamboo stake. And then, um, so this is saying to stub, stub prune, and then you have your buds underneath there. And then it's going to send out multiple shoots, in this case two. And then you'll, you'll take out the lower, more vigorous one usually, and then train this more vigorous one to this string to get it up to the, to the wire. And so this is, would be single trellis vine training. Um, and so this is using a bamboo um, stake. He's also already got his grow tube on there to protect, protect it from deer and for herbicide treatments. Got his irrigation line running above the ground, which is real common if you're using irrigation. Um, so anyways, you can see it's about four to five inches below the wire and it forms this V and he's got his cordons going in this direction. So just training onto a Geneva double curtain, real similar. Here they're right, it's right next to the post. Here it's right in the center. Either, either way is, is fine. Um, so you would, you would get that single trunk to come up to here, then you would, you would prune it and then get it to go laterally. And then you'd prune each of these again to get them to go, go on, the, on the wires in each direction. All right, so for pruning muscadines, Pruning is, muscadines are so forgiving. <laughs> and so there's a lot of different ways to, you know, recommendations for pruning, but don't be scared of pruning them. They, um, they, they can handle, you know, if you go too hard on them with pruning, they can handle it. Um, you've probably seen a lot of, a lot of muscadine vines in on old house sites that, that go several years without pruning and look like a complete mess. Well, they often even can recover from that. But to keep them productive, you need to prune them every year. Um, so it's best to prune in mid-January to mid-March. If you prune too early, they can be susceptible to some, some mid-winter temperatures at times. Um, and it can, uh, you know, there's some evidence that it might affect vegetative growth and get them too vegetative in the, in the spring. But for cold reasons, you would wanna wait until close to spring. And that's how we do our pruning for just about every every fruit crop is the closer we do it to spring is typically reduces the vegetative growth and and makes it better for reducing any any damage that might come from cold snaps all right so you're going to remove you don't want any any vines or any shoots coming off of of the main trunk and so you know you're going to remove all those you don't want anything crawling along the ground either um, especially if you're spraying herbicides and they can that can affect the whole vine um, grapes fruit on current season growth, seasons growth that arise from previous seasons growth. And so essentially they're gro you want to keep some of your one year old wood, that, the, the wood that grew last year, and then muscadines or grapes in general form from our, what's called a, um, a mixed bud. So they're going to send out these shoots that are vegetative as well as reproductive. And that's where all your fruit's going to come from. Um, so the, typically the recommendation has been to cut all the free, previous year's growth um, back to two to four nodes um, or per spur. Um, this, this is a, a spur right here. And so you can see that it looks, well, I'll, I'll have a better picture later, where it looks like cinnamon is on there and it's a lighter tan color. The older wood is going to be gray, typically. This doesn't really show that. But um, you, you'll be able to tell the difference between the, the one-year-old wood and the, and the older wood. And so you need some of this one-year-old wood for your fruit production. And so this bud right here is what's going to, to shoot out and form the, your, your new growth that's going to have the fruit on there. And so 
you can see this representation, you're gonna cut all these back to two to four buds on these spurs. And then with, with these spurs, you typically would want to, to, to thin out some of these spurs as well. And so some of these, this is probably just because of the, the diagram, but you really don't want them hanging down. And so that would be one that I might would look to, to remove, but you wanna space them out fairly evenly if, if possible on the main cordon. And so about every six inches or so. Um, and so this is just another, another diagram. And so in the winter, it's going to more or less, look, there's gonna be no leaves on there. It's gonna be a little bit easier to, to see what you're doing. You're gonna remove a lot of tangled vines and there might be, of course, you wanna remove anything that's dead or diseased. And, um, and then you want to, to remove a whole, 90% or more of the previous season's growth. And so you're, you're cutting all, the, all of this back to two to four nodes. So this would be a node or a bud right here. And so this, this is just one. If you cut it right here, that'd just be one. And that's sometimes advisable if it's a really vigorous vine. Um, but you don't have to worry too much about, about um, you know, you can, they can recover from a lot of pruning. This is just might make them more productive. So this is on a Geneva double curtain. And so this would be a before and this would be an after. And you, this might've been mechanically hedged right here. And so you probably would want to go back through and thin out some of those and clean it up. All right, now this one I just included because it's, maybe you can tell that like this wood right here is gray and then this is a tan. So this is previous season's wood. And so you need, need it to, um, to form your fruit for this coming season. And so here they've left it at, at, um, at one to two nodes, it looks like. Um, sometimes you'll leave as many as, as four or five. Um, with this particular vine, it's got a lot going on. And, um, and you'd probably, if I was going to, um, to really try to do my best at this, I'd probably start removing some of these spurs and tr start trying to, to space them out every six inches. You're not gonna get it perfect every six inches. And, um, and really the commercial recommendation and most of the recommendations these days are for balanced pruning. And so they, they recommend to, and it's, it's a great way to prune, um, but to base it on how vi vigorous these vines are. And so you're going to prune a more vigorous vine um, more, more, um, more severely or prune them, prune them more, take more buds off. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, you're, go you're going to have to, to take off a lot more vegetation, but you're gonna leave more buds because they're producing more, more leaves. And with those leaves, they get increased photosynthates and can handle a heavier crop load. And so if I'm growing di different types of muscadines, you're gonna see that there's differences in vigor and how much they, they grow and produce. And so you, you can, uh, can alter your pruning based on that. But for backyard production, it's probably just a good idea to it's simple to, to go with the leave two buds for spur. Um, for balanced pruning, it requires weighing all of the, um, all of the one-year-old um, trimmings, all the prunings from just the one-year-old wood, and then using a formula to then know how many buds to leave per square, I mean, per linear foot or, or per vine. And then if you know you need to leave 200 buds on a particular vine, then it doesn't matter as much how, you know, how, how you leave those buds. You're gonna prune all these back and you might take out this whole thing and just leave, you know, make sure you leave around 200 buds. But for backyard production, we've been growing muscadines for a long time and, and it's, it's pretty easy to just go back to two to four buds per, per spur. Um, only other pruning that, to, that you might consider would be, be hedging. And so these things can get really vigorous and you really don't want the vines touching the ground. And especially if you're trying to control weeds under there and, and keep varmints out of there. And so for commercial, it's recommended to, to hedge these maybe three times during the growing season. But um, you want it, you'd like it to look a little cleaner like this where it's off the ground. And, um, and so it's usually recommended to come through and you don't want to 
to hit, hit your fruit off of there, but remove some of these vigorous vines to keep them off the ground. Um, for fruit thinning, to a lot of our fruit tree crops, we, we thin a lot of the fruit. For peaches, apples, we're going to take off, you know, 80 to 90 percent of those fruits, so the remaining fruit will get big. With grapes, a lot of times they'll do it with European grapes, they'll remove a lot of the clusters, so the remaining clusters will, will ripen properly and be good quality. Um, with muscadines, we typically don't do much thinning, but there are some cultivars that overproduce, and if you notice, there's a whole lot of um, reproductive growth on there and not much, not enough leaves, <laughs> not enough uh, vegetative growth, then there are some cultivars that would benefit from removing some of that fruit. Because um, with the leaves comes, you know, they need enough photosynthesis to be produced for them to ripen properly and get enough sugars and all those things. And so fruit thinning could be advisable for some cultivars. All right, for fertilizer, I started to not even talk about fertilizer, but it, it, it's hard to get sound recommendations because it really depends a lot on your, your soil type, how much soil organic matter is in there. One thing, muscadines are, are tough. <laughs> and so if you have a, a high organic matter soil and, and, um, and if, especially if it's getting replenished with, with either mulch or, um, or compost, those type things, you, you can, they, they can do quite well without any fertilizer. And some growers even will just spot treat with fertilizer and not add fertilizer every year. Um, so the recommendations are typically when you, when you plant to just use a complete fertilizer about two weeks after planting and then put it in an 18 inch circle around the plant and then do that every month, um, the same amount in that, in that 18 inch circle around the plant. The, the, the amounts can be doubled the second year. And then in year three, about all they say is to, um, it's good to get leaf samples, leaf and petiole samples and see how, what nutrients are in that plant as well as soil samples to base your fertilization. But, um, but you can see nitrogen deficiency fairly easily in muscadines where it looked like, you know, general yellowing of the whole, uh, the whole plant it would show up in older leaves first. Um, but um, for some nutrients, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's always good to get these samples and really know what's going on. But, um, but muscadines are, are pretty drought tolerant and pretty um, um, don't need to survive and, and still produce pretty good. They don't need a huge fertilizer program. All right, for irrigation, again, they're, they're drought tolerant. Um, drip irrigation is what's used commercially. Um, it's not absolutely required, of course, in your backyard, but if, it, if it, we have a big drought period, especially during fruiting, then you're going to want to, uh, to make sure they, they get some water. Um, with our fluctuating weather, we, we at times, I know over here, we'll go the whole September without any, without any rain. And then we probably, we may have already picked our muscadines, but still they need that water to, for, for next season. And so, they, like most every other fruit crop, they, they recommend about one inch of water per week. Um, I should mention that when they're young, you, you're going to want to keep an eye on the watering. They can dry out, obviously, much, much faster when they're, when they're newly planted. All right, so finally, getting to talk about muscadine cultivars. And so with muscadine cultivars, that's a huge decision. Um, just about any muscadine you, you get is going to be tough and, and be good for most of our, our, um, our climates. Um, but you do need to know, most importantly, a little bit about the, the flowering of muscadines. And so within muscadines, there's female and there's self-fertile or perfect flowered plants. And so there are also male plants, but we don't, we don't want to worry about planting male plants that wouldn't have any fruit and just use for pollination. So we don't use male plants um, in, our, in our plantings. But this is a perfect flowered, which means it has both male and female parts. And then this is a female. And so you can see this is a, the female flower right here. And so it needs pollen from, from these to get onto this to produce a, the fruit. Um, and so you're going to have to have both out there, or you, you could go with just perfect, but a lot of the, the good muscadines are, are, are just female. 
And so if you have any female vines out there, then you need to have some perfect flowered cultivars out there as well. And it's typically recommended to have about a fourth of the vines be, be um, pollinizers. So if you have mainly females, make sure you have at least a fourth of the vines for their perfect flowered cultivars. And you probably won't maybe more than one pollinizer cultivar. Um, also, we'll go into, you know, there's a lot of research on different, different cultivars. There's a lot of good ones and there's hundreds of muscadine cultivars. So there's a lot to choose from and there's new ones being, being released all the time. So it's hard to, hard to keep up with. Um, these are some that are typically used for fresh um, production, Black Beauty, Supreme, Darlene, Summit, Sweet Jenny, Pam, Eudora. Eudora is fairly new. Um, these are all female types. And so if you're going to plant these, if you just plant one Black Beauty out there, you're not going to have hardly any fruit production or maybe none. Um, and so you need a self-fertile or, or perfect flowered <coughs> cultivar to go with it. Granny Val is often used as a, as a um, pollinizer, but these are all self-fertile ones. And so you need, you'll need some of those. Tara is a good one um, to pollinate the, the females. These are all good, good fresh eating muscadines. For juice and wine, Carlos and Noble have been the, the main muscadines produced for a long time, 40 years. And they still are, are the number ones produced because they're, they're really productive. Um, they used to be used both for, for fresh and, and still could be used for fresh, but there's, they've been out, out competed on the fresh market with some of these other ones, but they, they're mainly used for wine. And so Carlos for a white wine and Noble for the, um, the red wine. You also might choose your, your muscadine cultivar based on when they produce. And so early season, these are some of the, that, that are early fruit. Mid season would be a, a bulk of the, the muscadines, but Darlene, Fry, Ison, Supreme, those are all mid season ones. Uh, late season would be some of these. There's a good list in the, um, in, again, the muscadine production guide for the Southeast. You can just Google that and they have a much more comprehensive list of, well, it's still not comprehensive, but they have a lot more cultivars listed than me. All right, so here's some of the, um, the bronze types. Darlene is a, is a big favorite in Alabama at a lot of our research stations and, and just with people in general. I think it's, um, I guess it's been around for a while and, and people are just real familiar with it, but it is a really big berry and it's um and it's really sweet and so we like our our sweet <laughs> fruit and so darlene all of these would be sweet but i guess darlene sort of has a name over here granny val is a is a good one and it's a again self-fertile Terra's self-fertile and so both of these are, are market acceptable or you'd like to eat them in your backyard and so they would be good pollinizers for darlene or some of the others Here's some of the, um, the dark muscadines. Um, Supreme is a good one. Look at that berry right there. They can be quite huge. Um, Southern Home, I think I have another picture of it. It's a, it actually has some Vitus vinifera, some European grape in its background. And so the fruit is, is a muscadine, tastes just like a, a muscadine, but the, um, but the leaves look more like a, a European grape. And so it's, it's it's thought to be a, a a um an attractive plant and so it's it's usually advertised as a good ornamental type of of vine that you can also get good fruit production on um so there's a there's a lot black beauty is another really good one um this is some of the information from dr alina conaba where she's she's done a lot of research with grapes including muscadines and she did a cultivar trial that didn't include Supreme, but these are the berry sizes. Darlene was the biggest berry, um, but Black Beauty is, a, is another really good one. All of them taste good. I mean, they're all, um, all good for you. So these are the, from that cultivar study, these are the ones that had the highest yields. Pam was the number one, I remember that, but all of these had higher, high yields. Large berry size, Darlene was, was included in there, but Pam, Black Beauty, you can get 
um, high yield and large fruits, bear, large berry size with, with a lot of these. And then high sugars, Darlene, I know was way up there and some of these others. So, um, so this is Pam. Pam was, is a very productive and a pretty big berry, a bronze type. Again, it's, um, it's a female type pistolate, so it needs a pollinizer. Darlene, large berry, high sugar, usually um, definitely one of the crowd favorites. It's been around a long time and there might be some, some newer, newer and better, but it's a, it's a good one. Um, Black Beauty, very good crop, large fruit size. I like Black Beauty. Again, pistolate. Eudora, I don't know a lot about Eudora. It's fairly new from USDA in Mississippi. This one came from, from there as well. And maybe you can see that the, uh, you know, it, look, it doesn't look like a muscadine leaf. And so it's actually a pretty attractive uh, vine and um, it's not going to be used commercially. It's, mar it's marketed towards homeowner use. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, you know, with muscadines, again, they're an inside eating fruit. And I'm sorry, an, an outside eating fruit because we often will spit out the seeds, sometimes spit out the skin. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, telling you to, to start, start eating those skins. And, um, and I think we have made a lot of improvement with some of these new cultivars that are coming out of Georgia and other places where um, the skins are more adhering to the flesh. They're not as tart and, and leathery. So they're more pleasant to, to, to eat. Well, Rasmataz is one that came from a private breeding program and, and, um, and, and is, is marketed where most muscadines will be about $10 a, or less a plant. These, when they first came out, were $100 a plant. And um, the excitement was that it was sort of the first, he, he has seedless muscadines. And he's got and he's been been crossing them with um with European grapes and and has some good stuff. This one I don't think was marked. It's not marketed as a muscadine, but it has, I believe, some muscadine um, properties and, and and genetics in its background. But it continually fruits and and um and apparently is is uh, a a pretty good grape. But it, we have not we have very limited testing thus far, mostly because of the hundred dollars for the plant. <laughs> But um, and he and he's been pretty protective of his of his stuff. I, I looked at this yesterday, and they're fifty dollars a plant now. But um, the berries are I've seen these. The berries are tiny, really tiny. But it's a not going to be a commercial um, crop. But um, but it's pretty neat, perhaps in the in your backyard to have fruit that continually gets ripe and and um, it's flowering and, and fruiting for a, a long season. Oh my, is is what they're saying is the first seedless muscadine that's come out there. And there was a seedless fry that came out a long time ago, but, um, but it's, it's not really seedless um, and it's not very productive. And so it never, never really caught on. Oh my, I haven't tried yet, but um, again, it's pretty proud of their plants and, and um, for a muscadine that's, that's un unheard of, but, um, but, Apparently it's pretty exciting that he has the first seedless muscadine, has a lot of muscadine characteristics and, and um, it's thought to be a, a really good one, but I, I have no experience with it. Um, to touch on bunch, bunch grapes, we, um, this is mostly from a study from Dr. Alina Conova. And, and so with bunch grapes, you're gonna just use Pierce's disease tolerant bunch grapes. And this is a list of Pierce's disease tolerant bunch grapes. Blanc de Bois is a big one in Texas and, um, and um, it's getting a lot of press. And that was, was part of this study. So all these were, were tested. All these are supposed to be Pierce's disease tolerant and are options for bunch grapes. They're not, it's not all inclusive, but this is a pretty good list. Um, so if you have Pierce's disease, again, there's no chemical control options. All you can do is try to manage, manage the insect vectors and that's almost impossible. Um, you can try to manage the surrounding areas, the vineyard floor, and, but really you got to choose the right cultivar that's resistant to Pierce's disease, especially for, um, you know, for backyard production. Um, so just choose a cultivar that you can grow. And so these were kind of the results of that. Uh, 
Villard Blanc, favorite, Black Spanish, all those were highly productive, had the best yields. Blanc Dubois came on slow at first, but had very good yield, some of the highest yields in the last two seasons of, of her study. Um, none of them, I believe, got actually got Pierce's disease throughout this study. I'm not positive on that, but it wasn't, wasn't reported. Um, but all those, these seem to be the most, most productive. Most of these are primarily used for wine production, but obviously pretty good to eat too. All right, so I think that's, that's it. Hopefully we have time for, for questions. Should I stop sharing now, Ashley? Uh, uh, you can leave it. Uh, so we have something to look at. <laughs> um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I want to plant muscadines in my yard now. Me too. Um, they're a great fruit. I think that she did a good job letting us know what's feasible in our backyard landscapes. We did have a few questions come in that I think probably lots of folks are interested in. One being the uh, very common situation where, you know, you might buy a new home that had old existing vines or um, you have a family member that might have some vines that need to be wrangled that have some years on them and things are really out of control. Any tips on how to reclaim a neglected vine? Yeah, that's a good question. There are lots of situations like that in, in the South. Um, um, it, I guess it depends on the situation, but with, with any pruning, I'm going to start with all the d dead and diseased and bad looking stuff and get rid of that. Then I'm going to reassess. And then and with muscadines, you can go ahead and, and hedge off everything <laughs> except for, you know, leaving some stubs on the ends of the spurs. And then see how healthy those are. Again, remove the dead, dead wood, depending on how, how bad they are. If they're, if they're dead, you might, can, might have to start over. <laughs> you might have to, to stub prune on the trunk to get new vigorous growth. But in most situations, you're gonna be able to reclaim those, those old vines if they're, if they're still living and um, get rid of all the disease and, and dead looking tissue. And then try to spur prune a lot of, and get it back to a manageable, uh, shape where you're having, um, it, you might lose a year of production if depending on how much you have to cut off, but, but I doubt you will. Usually they'll, they'll manage to have some fruit. And then after you, you prune those, you can increase the productivity and get back into um, the normal pruning situation. So two questions to piggyback on that. Um, so whenever you're doing regenerative pruning, that's probably going to happen in the dormant season, right? So um, do we need to apply fertilizer on a year where we do heavy pruning? And what is with the uh, fluid that comes out of the vines after I prune? Is that okay? Or what's the story there? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> usually the, the, the to talk, touch on the fluid, that's um that that's real common and and it's okay. <laughs> um, it is it is a reason that we typically would would prune, you know, after the chance of of um of a hard freeze, um or, or closer to to spring. But um but even so, they, they typically that happens and and usually it 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 doesn't harm them from winter temperatures with that with that fluid. Um, as far as fertilizer. Um, so yeah, depending on the regenerative cut, um, I guess if you're just saying cutting it down by the trunk, is that maybe? Yeah, like extreme pruning for when, um, you know, you're trying to reclaim a neglected vine and you've taken out a lot of fruiting spurs and, um, would that be a year where you would want to fertilize more or what, any tips on, on fertility and pruning? Mm. That's a good question. I guess um, I guess w with any with muscadines, I would typically err on the side of of under fertilizing in most cases because they they're pretty tolerant of of um, they're they're tough plants in general. If um if it's a neglected vine that's been been growing for a long time, I would I would see what the growth looks like, and then if it if it looks really yellow and, and, and looks like it needs some fertilizer after a while, then I wouldn't, then I would, would add a complete fertilizer and, um, 
and add it, you know, in increments, you know, small amounts, and then, um, and then do that fairly, fairly frequently. Um, depending on how much you cut off, you, you might not have a whole lot of fruit production that, that next year. And so, um, you might not, you don't want to overdo it on the fertilizer and get them too vegetative to where they're, they become much more of a mess to deal with, with the pruning again. And so, um, it, I guess it depends on if you're on, I guess I would err on, on not fertilizing too much, um, because you're, they're mostly probably going to grow vegetative with the large, um, with the large cuts. Right. Yeah. Uh, it depends. Our favorite horticultural answer and never underestimate the value of doing a soil test as well to see, you know, if there's something missing that's needed. Um, something else that's come up is what about fruit drop? Is that a normal thing on muscadines? Should I expect a level of fruit to be dropped um, during the season? Do I need to thin muscadines for backyard use? Um, you'll definitely, you'll often see a lot of fruit drop because of pollination, you know, when that, when that fruit's just, just forming. But um, I would say you don't expect too much, too much other fruit drop. You might can help me, help me with this one, Ashley, but, um, <laughs> But once they they get set, and then um, then unless they get damaged from insects or something like that, I don't expect too much fruit drop. You know, and there's not a, a pre-harvest fruit drop associated with muscadines that I that I know of. Most of it would be early due to poor pollination, and you should expect that because they they can they put out a a whole lot of um a whole lot of flowers typically, and and they're not all gonna gonna be pollinated properly and and I'd say that's pretty common for fruit thinning um, with uh, muscadines can hold a, a fairly, fairly large amount of fruit. It, again, it can be advisable depending on the vigor of the vine and you can tell if it's overloaded with fruit and it's not a vigorous vine or it doesn't have a lot of leaves to compensate for that. So the, you know, with, with all fruit, the more fruit they have, the more photosynthates they need to go to that fruit to get them to, to ripen up. And so you need a fair amount of leaves <laughs> that are photosynthesizing in order to get those, those fruit to size up and to, to get sugar in those fruit. And so um, fruit thinning is real common in bunch grape production, less common in, in, in muscadines, but, um, but for certain cultivars, it, it can be advisable. And, and when these, if these vines look like they're struggling, and they're not growing very vigorously, then um, you might need to sacrifice some fruit to get them to, them to grow properly. Oh, that's great, thank you. Another question that seems to be common is, um, should I try to trellis my wild vine? Or um, what's your thoughts on wild vines versus cultivated varieties? Is it worth trying to train up that wild vine out in the backyard or would you be better off purchasing a, a cultivated variety and, and trellising it? I would, I'd say <laughs> much better <laughs> to buy, to buy one because it could be a big waste of your time, but um, you could get lucky with them um, with, you know, if you've already tried the fruit and you want to, to give it a shot, but, but yeah, in my, in my mind, I would much rather, rather have one. I, I know, know what it is. It's tried and true. And, and I know it's going to, going to be um, productive and um, because it is some effort with, with trellising these, these things and keeping an eye on them. So I would, I'd much rather have a, a named cultivar, but, but you awesome. could, you know, who knows, you could have the next, the next named cultivar. <laughs> That's great. Um, another question that I found intriguing was someone inquired about growing muscadines out in Arizona. Um, are muscadines only restricted to the southeast or is it related to growing zone? Um, any tips for folks who are tuning in um, outside of the southeast? Uh, that's, that's good. That's good. Um, <laughs> with, I mean, they're native to the southeast in condition to our, our climate, which, um, which part of that climate is, requires upwards of 200 growing degrees or um, of growing de of, of days in the season. And so that, that 
muscadines bloom and, and produce fairly late for us, you know, in April. And so they, um, they, and then, then they don't come into harvest until, you know, late August sometimes, depending on the cultivar, September. And so it's, it requires a long season. And so I'm not sure um, if, if um, it might be possible in Arizona, but it's, it, it would definitely be a, a trial <laughs> basis. Um, another problem with muscadines is that they are cold sensitive. And so they, they say they can, they can handle temperatures to negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit when they're, when they're hardened, but, um, but they can be cold sensitive depending on how young they are and, and, um, and at, at much higher temperatures. And so that's why our range of, of, of muscadine production pretty much ends at, at Tennessee and, you know, North Georgia and into North Carolina and doesn't go much higher than that. But, um, but Arizona, you know, could be a possibility. Yeah, I think that the like cold factor is certainly a concern. Yeah. Was that Josh chiming in? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I thought I heard. Um, another question that seems to be popping up is, um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on female varieties versus um, self-fertile varieties and, and how, if you have a female type, um, how do you pick a pollinator? Do they need to have, you know, do they both need to be early varieties or can you do an early and a late and that be adequate for pollination? That's a good question. I would, I would tend to, to base it on when they're going to, to produce fruit. And so typically, um, and I, I think that's how it was for muscadine. You can chime in if you if you know different, but typically with blueberries, muscadines, things you would base it on their season. So that's typically related to when their bloom period is. And so, if I have a female cultivar, I, I would want to um, to have a, a perfect flowered cultivar that um, is about the same season. Um, now the bloom period can be fairly long for for muscadines and that's why they ripen at different different times and so you it's you might can get by really with a, having a, a late season pollinizer and a and a mid season or or earlier um, um, female type but I would try to play it safe typically and have have um, you know a pollinizer that's mid season or pretty comparable to when they when the others are what I do you agree. Um, would it matter if it was a bronze and a purple type? Does the color matter? Um, would you still get pollination? Still get pollination. Perfect. Um, any tips for nuisance wildlife control, like squirrels? Um, black bear are an issue up here in my neck of the woods, but it's, it's a difficult battle. I don't know if there's one single silver bullet to keep the birds away, but any tips for us? That's a tough one. <laughs> I've just in my backyard, I've tried the owls and, you know, for a while it was working and I, you know, cause I was moving them, but they, they caught on. Um, there's a lot of different strategies out there, particularly for, for birds. And I don't know if any of them are besides netting really are foolproof. Luckily muscadines usually have enough to share. Right. That's how I would combat it is, um, is to, uh, count on losing some to, to birds or, or other things and, and not worry about it. But I guess it depends on the situation. I know that's always an unfortunate question because we don't really have a great answer for wildlife control. Um, something else that was mentioned by several folks is they've got older vines. Um, each year they seem to get less and less fruit. Um, any thoughts on what might be going on with fruit set on older vines? Well, um, depending on how you're pruning, those spurs get, get played out after a while. And so if you're, you know, if you're each time pruning back to, to two to four buds, then it kind of gets further and further out there at times. And, and sometimes, you know, within five or six years, those spurs just not, might not be that productive anymore. So at times you need to renew those, those spurs. And depending on um, the severity of the cut or what you, what, um, what's needed to rejuvenate that vine, you might, might lose a good bit of production one year 
but you can sort of rejuvenate those vines in a lot of cases by, you know, kind of starting over, you know, <laughs> getting, getting new growth and then, then, then um, starting to select new spurs and that type of, of situation. So would you mind um, elaborating on that a little bit? So for folks um, who are really new to muscadine pruning with those fruiting spurs, I know as the plant ages, kind of like deer antlers, these things get more and more complicated and larger as the, as the vine ages. Um, once you have a really crowded cordon with aged spurs, how do, you, how do you get rid of them? Do you get loppers and just remove them like flush with the cordon or do you saw them off? Like how do you, how do you uh, make those choices? Yes, you can, you can use lop, loppers. And then if that doesn't work, you can use a saw. But, um, but yeah, so some of these, um, this is pretty crowded. And so what they're doing is, you know, this gray wood is getting further and further away. And then at times it gets to be, you know, too much, too crowded. I'd like it to be simpler. And so I would, I would, you know, cut this one off. That's going down flush. I might even cut this whole thing off. That's going going down um the fruit is going to come from this this one right here it's going to come from these and then there's one further out here maybe one here um you know if they're getting less productive at, at a certain point you're going to need to to start over and cut that off right here and then um and then typically another another spur will end up coming out near there right um, and so for, for a while, you're just cutting these spurs back to two to two to four buds. And then it, you know, as they get older, you got to focus more on, on thinning out these spurs to have them approximately six inches or so apart. You know, the old timers would say to, you know, put your fist in there and, and then space them out like that and then leave um, typically two, two buds. That's great. Thank you for elaborating on that. I know that we're, we're um, well after one, but we definitely wanted to make sure we could answer some questions. So I'm gonna ask you two more and then I'm gonna uh, let everyone um, go have their lunch break. But one question that was asked was, um, do I need to um, paint the trunk? Any um, thoughts on trunk painting and if it's necessary? That's a good question. And you're in grape country, aren't you? I mean, I know people do it, but um but I don't know how necessary it is. Um, during my research, I saw where, where um, some of the commercial growers would, would paint the trunks. Um, and, and I mean, painting the trunks is, is often to, to keep them from warming up so they don't get, get um, cold damage. But also, I didn't, you might have noticed, I didn't talk about any disease or insect problems with muscadines. But, um, but, but I mean, that, that production guide can, can help you out there, but I didn't want to focus on it much because there, we can have problems with anything, but muscadines is one of the ones that, that is, doesn't suffer too much from diseases. But insect pests, not too much, but you might get some Japanese um, beetles sometimes or different insect pests, these leaf hoppers feeding on them. But the grape root borer is... Yeah. The most significant pest and sometimes they would when they're painting the trunks they might have lores band or something in there that keeps keeps them from getting infected with these root bores um but um but i don't know how common it is really i don't ever see it over here but do you maybe in your neck of the woods do people typically paint them um i i, I not particularly I, I think some folks do i i think a lot of that kind of comes down to what do I do to prevent Southwest injury, um, especially for younger vines that haven't hardened and gotten that more fibrous um, bark to protect it? Um, also just general, I think, cold protection, you know, never underestimate the value of just getting some spun woven polypropylene, you know, freeze cloth from like the garden center and, and wrap that trunk, but I wouldn't sweat it too much about painting truck trunks. Um, the only other question that um, I have for you was, um, do we need to use um, wound paint 
to for these um, pruning cuts. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I think that this has been a very informative session. Thank you for hanging around, Dr. Spears, and answering some of our questions. Uh, Again, it's difficult when we have folks tuning in from many different states, it's difficult to make specific recommendations for fertilizer and things like that, because it really depends on the age of the plant and where you're located. But um, we encourage you to reach out to your local county extension contacts, no matter where you are, as you can see, um, we have uh, faculty in Alabama, LSU, Tennessee, all over the place who can help you with your specific questions. So, um, I hope you enjoyed this session. And uh, for those of you who are tuning in for this Friday session on strawberries, I'll see you then. Thank you.